as well. And if this queen is supposed to represent the best of us, right, the best of Britishness, she's never been to a food bank. Well, I'm sorry. If you no, no, think, I'm if sorry. You think, well, if she I've cares never, about... I've never been to a food bank. Yeah, but you're not the queen. Well, no. She's supposed to care about all oh, her people. come on, yeah. What you're, do you mean? You're, well, what, what, you're do you doing, mean? what you're doing is writing a headline. You're not really making a no, serious point. No, I'm making point. a very serious point. No, you're not. Well, there are well, people well, going hungry who are using food banks. Wouldn't it be great if she made a symbolic... Well, well it might be. Well, what's can I finish? Well, well, can she come if you're and, make and a stood... Point? and visited a food bank and put pressure on the government which has created the situation where we've got these food banks. Don't you think that would be important? No, no, no I don't actually think yeah, it would be important. I think not. you're trivialising points it's not just to a make, trivial just to make a headline. Stop, 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 stop. Can you take it? It's Friday night and it's the Queen's Jubilee with Byline Times and with me, Hardeep Mathuru. And with me, Peter Jukes, and for the next hour or so, we'll be bringing you what the papers don't normally say. And what the TV doesn't always want to tell you. Well, coming up, something a little bit different. It's... Our Jubilee, Jubilee Tea, tea Party. party. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, let's get some scones in. Uh, prosecco, some cheap Prosecco. Yes, we don't spare any expense here. Joining us will be none other than Byline Times columnist Otto English, a keen royal observer. And Yasmin Arabai Brown, the author and the I newspaper columnist, will also be popping in for a scone. And if he wants a tea cake, he's welcome to one. Tom Burke will be joining us, environmentalist and campaigner and a long-term friend of Prince Charles. Well, Huddy, 70 years unprecedented, the longest reigning monarch in British history. Queen Elizabeth II was born in 1926, same year as my mother, slightly different circumstances, my mother was put up for adoption. She then ascended to the throne in 1952, unexpectedly as her uncle had abdicated and her father had died prematurely. From an empire that was covering a quarter of the world's map to the post-colonial Commonwealth era, from Sir Winston Churchill to Call cool Britannia and everything in between, including the recent pandemic when the Queen told us that we will meet again. The British monarch has occupied a unique position in modern British history. But where will the institution which she has served her life to protect go from here? Well, whether you're a royalist or a republican or don't really care either way, we'll be looking back and looking forward to this unique reign and whether we'll ever look upon her like again. Now, the Jubilee celebrations have already been underway for the past couple of days across the country. Let's take a look at how they have been unfolding. The Queen, also the head of the armed forces. For her, an 82-gun salute. So we're joined by Otto English, the author known as Andrew Scott and also author of the great book, Fake History, attuned to many myths and legends and reality. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Cheers. 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 Yes. Cheers. Finally. So you've, um, I'll have a quick sip of this. Mm, very cheap, Prince Echo. Um, <laughs> you are uh, maybe if someone landed from another country. Explain to them what is going on over this weekend. Where are we? What's happened? So, let's go back to 1977, shall we? Okay. Which I can remember that far back. The Silver Jubilee. Oh, yes. 77. Jubilee, Jubilee Line, named after her? Yes, the Jubilee Line, yes, Jubilee Line Extension as well, which came a dec decade or so, two decades later. Anyway, I remember 1977. I was a small child. I remember my parents waking me ridiculously early in the morning and taking me down to see the Queen because it was the Silver Jubilee and that's all anybody had talked about. Now back then, 
As when, you can remember, because you would have been in your middle age by then. <laughs> Back then, uh, there was enormous reverence for the royals. I don't remember that. I do remember God Save the Queen, Never Mind the Bollocks. I don't, yes. well, I don't really remember the 19th. It was her 25th. So it was her 25th, and, and the, the Sex Pistols brought out Never uh, yeah. God Save the Queen, Never Mind the Bollocks at the same time. I didn't, wasn't aware of that at the time. I, that's all I was aware of. Because I was a small child. Oh, of course. And I remember my parents taking me down and I had a Union Jack and we all waved. But I mostly remember being bored out of my skull. This is kind of my summary of most royal occasions. And that is my experience of most royal occasions since. And, and so we had, a, we had one, didn't we, in 2000. No, so there was another one in 2002. Yeah. The Sex Pistols re-released God Save the Queen, and that time it went to number one, because, remember, they thought they'd been cheated of it in uh, 1977. Yeah. 2002, you have the Golden Jubilee. That was expected to be a flop, but it mm. wasn't a flop mm. because Blair's team, probably Mandelson or somebody, they decided what they would do is they would make it a people's party. So they took over Buckingham Palace... They had Brian May playing the national oh, anthem on the crazy. roof of Buckingham Palace. That's 2002. That was in 2002, and they decided they would make it this bit. In fact, a friend of mine, Harry, who was a press photographer, was on that roof with Brian May taking the snaps and, and looking was, out across the crowd. If you had to summarise the brand of the Queen, if she has one, what would you say that is, Otto? What's her, what, how it's is an she an ever-evolving brand. You, like you missed... all good brands, it's like the Mini. It has changed subtly over the years until you have something which you've got now in 2022, which is completely different to what you had in 1950. Well, the Mini, famously now, is made in Germany, and the royal family was originally made in Germany. Don't Germany get me started. Saxe-Coburg. Don't get me started. Oh, no, <laughs> there was 2012, and wasn't our house... Didn't they project yes, madness? That's right. At our house. But so having seen a clip of that. Yes, they projected. Having it. Said, yes, exactly. So having sorry, having um, done the 2002 party at the palace. Mm. They did the same thing in 2012, pretty much, but it it, uh, it was at the same time as the Olympics. Ah, uh, yes. So we had that 2012 year where every, even though you had mm. the coalition government, there was a sort of feeling of goodwill. Mm. There was a feeling of goodwill generally a, about the Queen and the royal family, I believe, then, and I don't think I'm sensing the same mood now. Well, what is this change that's happened? You say the brand is ever-evolving, Otto, but it's very, very different now from 1952. What are the big markers that signify that change, do you think? I think, to be honest, the Prince Andrew stuff has had a far deeper effect on mm. people's view of the royal family than anyone's really letting on. You still have these hushed BBC royal correspondents and ITV and all royal correspondents doing their hushed, mm. reverential stuff. Uh, and I don't think it washes with 2022 audiences. That you've got... The, the reporting of the royal family is being done in the same rough way that it was being done in 1977 in the Dimbleby kind of era. But you've got uh, the reality of these horrendous stories about Prince Andrew, lawsuits, etc., etc., etc. The the royal family generally beneath the Queen is not held in such high regard as it mm. was 10, 20, 30 years ago. But the woman herself is still... I mean, whether, whether you know, our viewers might like the Queen, they might be completely indifferent to monarchy, they indeed might be Republicans. Yeah. But the Queen has been seen as having done a good job in terms of 70 years of public service. Do you think once she is no longer the monarch that the situation will change quite a lot? I believe it will change radically. And I, and I cannot... Uh, OK, cards on the table... I am a small R Republican in mm. that I d would prefer this country to be a republic. I do, I, I'm not a sort of burn the house, the Buckingham Palace down type person. I do think we need to have some sort of transition to a different type of democracy. But I do, if you are Republican minded, 
I think you can feel quite positive right now because I cannot see anybody. The Queen actually might come to be seen as having been the person who destroys the monarchy because she did such a great job. So there's a... nobody will ever be able to live up to it. That's quite something no, to think about, isn't it, Otto? Yeah. It's, it's like very a, interesting. A yeah. Full stop, exception. Mm. But just a little bit more on this, because I saw it. Their attempt to become TV friendly, more accessible. There was a documentary called The Royal Family. Yes. And we always, because I had, there were five, six kids in my family, always compared with each. And unfortunately, I lined up with Andrew uh, <laughs> in terms of age. Uh, but also, you know, they, they encourage celebrities. So I remember the 2012 celebration because uh, I worked with Lenny Henry a lot and he was hosting this madness concert along with Rolf Harris. Another person who's quite close to the monarch, particularly Charles, as we know, was Jimmy Savile. And so every time they fumble into the world of mm. modern populism, they also stumble. And this is the mystery. Is that it's supposed to be a mystery, the monarchy, but it's supposed to be the people's monarchy as well. And those two tensions, particularly with Harry and Meghan, we see embodied, they're supposed to be accessible, but remote. How do you have both? Mm. It's a fact. So, the documentary to which you allude was in 1968. That's the same year that Prince Charles is made the Prince of Wales. We'll talk about that later with the And Advent. it was produced by the BBC and I think ITV in concert with each mm -hmm. other uh, after a long period of discussion with Prince Philip, who, and again, Pr Prince Philip we now think of as late-era Prince Philip when he was going around making racist comments about fuse boxes, but early Prince Philip was a reformer. He wanted yeah. to drag Buckingham Palace and the monarchy into the 20th century. And it was partly his idea they made that documentary, which was a catastrophic PR disaster because when they put it out in colour film on BBC mm -hmm. Two, because it, BBC Two had just gone to colour TV, um, when they put it out in colour, the British public didn't see this mystical, distant figure, which is what the Queen is presented to us as, they saw instead a sort of upper-class Midlands housewife, Elizabeth Windsor, who was arguing with her husband and children about the barbecue arrangements. At one point, famously, Prince Charles is playing a cello and a string snaps and pings into Prince Edward's face. Prince Edward was then about three or four. Prince Edward starts crying and the Queen has to take him out to go and get ice creams. I mean, it's like a, it's, anybody who's had children, it's like a they sort of the classic, totally the destroy the mystery. As a result, they buried that documentary mm. and it's never, ever been shown again. Well, we might not be able to get a clip of that documentary because it's been buried, but let's look at some other clips of the Queen in her earlier days, and then we'll be joined for more Tea Party festivities with Yasmin Alibi Brown. So I said to her, what an extraordinary remark to make, very unkind about anybody. And uh, so, you know, I stood in the middle of the room and pressed the bell and the doors opened, and there was a grimmer. <laughs> <laughs> and I had the most terrible trouble in <clears throat> keeping, you know, he had Short body, long arms. <laughs> Thank you. Disgusting. Just a gooey mess. It's going to be in the car, isn't it? The Queen set out for Westminster Abbey in the Gold State coach. It weighs nearly four tonnes. The Queen was also happy. The eminent persons group was on its way to end apartheid. And the lid was back on her difficult relationship with Mrs Thatcher. The Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh had just been reunited with their children after five months away on a world tour. They were extremely polite. I don't think they knew who we were at all. And now let's welcome the writer and columnist Yasmin Alibi Brown to the Byline Times Jubilee Tea hey, Party. Cheers. Hello, Yasmin. Welcome. 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 Enjoy the cheapest lecker. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're making me very embarrassed. I shouldn't be doing this. I'm a Republican. Well, anyway. Oh, I thought you meant drinking out. Let's, no, no, no. We're going to get on fine. to that. Alcohol's fine. We'll get on to that. But what is your earliest memory, Yasmin, of the Queen? Well, <laughs> pictures, lots of pictures. Because, of course, she was in East Africa. She was in Kenya. 
remember mm. when the, the moment happened and she was staying in a tree house. I remember pictures of all of that. Um, but then we, as little, little children, we had to line the streets of Kampala, the capital, which is quite a small place, and we were all given little tins, pencil cases, with the, her face and flags and all of this. And it had Cadbury's chocolate inside. So we were stood for hours in the sun for some bloke with white-plumed hat who was going to drive through, representing the Queen. And the chocolate was melting and we were melting. And I think that was probably the first time I thought, oh, why am I doing this? But yes, that's my memory of it. And is that still the case now? Why, why do we have the monarchy? Why do we have to wait for our chocolate? Yes, and well, it's melted. And what was the point of giving us chocolate? But, you know, there was this kind of total brainwashing thing going on during the empire. So you had this lovely pencil case and eraser with a Union Jack on it. Um, and, yeah, God. It was actually a... reminded me that during the 1977 Silver Jubilee, I was given an Easter egg that had a mug with the Queen on it underneath. Like it was a, oh, yes, it was like a mug of the Queen, mm. and then you have and it was a, it was a silver jubilee Easter egg, and it's now making me think of all those people who go crazy about they've taken Easter off the Easter egg, and I'm now, and this is a clear. I, I think I still even had the mug somewhere. It's a white mug of the silver well, jubilee. That's the separation of church and state. This the head of the Church of England moving into Christmas. I've never forgotten this. I was eight years old, and I went to see a Charlie Chaplin film on Saturday morning. And um, I didn't come from a rich family, so we really had to put the pennies together and borrow from my friend's mum so we could go to the cinema. And suddenly I decided I wasn't going to stand up for God save the Queen. I just thought, why should I? And they threw me out and they never returned the money. What? I never saw the film. They never returned my money because I didn't stand up. How old were you? Eight. I was see eight the years. beginnings of Republicanism here. It was stirred very early. What, so what does it signify? What has it always signified to you, Yasmin, the monarchy and the queen? What it signified, uh, uh, you know, if I was an Indian, the Maharajas would have been the same. This in idea of an inherited privilege that you're born and you can be ugly or dull or stupid or anything, but somehow, as a child you are immediately treated as more than any other child in the kingdom. So a child born in the same minute as, say, one of the children of Prince William, in the same minute, this baby that belongs to William and Catherine will automatically be imbued with mm. privilege. And I can't say that that absolutely... Uh, should not, I, I mean, what I believe is in a democracy, you cannot have these people at the top of the pyramid. What we need to have is every child born has an opportunity. Can, and some of them will never make it, but at least there is that possibility. The monarchy doesn't allow that possibility. Mm -hmm. And I can't bear that, actually. That's a very profound point because also, according to our current monarch, the accident of birth, you know, was her arrival. And her departure will be decided effectively, I think the belief is, divine right, by God, the moment of mortality. I've always thought this interesting about, you know, the obsession with the private lives of monarchs and their scions and Diana and things like this, because yeah. that is relevant who, you know, the moment of election is the moment of the sperm hitting an egg. Mm. That's the next generation. Well, it's really interesting for, for me to hear Yasmin's thoughts on it because it's funny because my parents' generation of immigrants from former colonies that came to Britain, and I think there's, you know, quite a few, actually, who do... It's not... I, I, I'm often asked, you know, do your parents like the Queen? It's not that they love her. It's more that I think that generation is sort of fascinated by the Queen and the monarchy insofar as it represents something very British. Yes. And I think it's almost like the embodiment of some values. And it's, it's, there's, a fa there's an intrigue, I think. There's not necessarily a wholesale 
sort of uh, acceptance of it. But there's something there that is so symbolic. And I, I really see that in people of immigrant backgrounds. And so I grew up uh, watching all, all the royal weddings and Prince Charles and Diana. That was, a, that was a big thing that played out. And I still know a lot about the royal family, what's going on with Kate and William and, and all this sort of thing. And I think it's that interest that my parents' generation had uh, has filtered into, you know, we're supposed, they're supposed to be the family of the country. You know, we're supposed to somehow... <laughs> to feel represented but... but that was but that was a reinvention of the mm. royal family that happened during the reign of queen elizabeth so they they yeah they reinvented what monarchy was and they turned it into a national family that's that wasn't what monarchy used to be mm. there is no divine right of kings because we haven't had that since the 17th century well, but she believes in that. Well, I, she she might well do. I mean, but, but again, once you remove that, the whole conceit of monarchy falls apart anyway. Because as Yasmin was saying, why should one family be held up above all others? And also, this whole thing sustains the whole notion of the class system, exactly. of aristocracy, exactly. of blue blood. The whole Empire. thing, the whole thing, is a complete nonsense. And and yet, almost nobody dares to say it. It's it's literally the emperor's new clothes. It is. And when you do, you get a lot yeah. of kind of uh, emo quite genuine emotions. But one of the things is also to, to... I remember seeing the teacher in the nursery school that George, Prince George, its name, I think, and she curtsied before this child. Mm. And I thought, there's something quite <laughs> mad here. Yeah. It is the kind of divinity that they think these people are. I've only <laughs> met the Queen once, by the way, very briefly, uh, opening a college in Cambridge. She's bright orange. She wore this bright orange makeup. And I was, it was such a weird thing meeting somebody you'd seen on the stamps for your, your whole life. My mother had this ambiguous relationship with the Queen, a bit like you talk about with your parents, that she was very Republican in many ways. But she said, oh, they have such a difficult job. Yeah. Imagine all those flunkies curtsying you and doing all those things. But I, the question is, therefore, are, are we saying, as Otto said, made this great point, she's so perfect in a way, her reign, so long, covers so many, in a way she's blown the brand and that nobody else can match it anymore because people have a lot of affection, like the great-great-grandmother she is, is she great-great, anyway, for her. But when she's gone, does Charles, will William, will anybody else have that level of affection? No, and also even the Queen. I mean, I'm not falling into this propaganda that everybody loves. I mean, I heard uh, Antonia Fraser say on uh, the BBC Radio, everybody loves the Queen. Actually, no. OK, no. Uh, everybody doesn't, because I don't know her. How can I love her? That's a really important point. Yeah? Nobody knows her. Yeah. So, the, so, so, but also, yeah. if you look at her record, the most recent being the scandal of bringing Andrew on her out mm -hmm. at a time when the nation actually is quite horrified. Mm. She imposes Charles on the Commonwealth. They wanted to elect the next head of Commonwealth. She imposed Charles on them. And like your parents and my family, people are feel an attachment to her. And so they, they said, oh, well, you know, this she has been at the mm -hmm. heart of it, so if that is her wish... How undemocratic is that? She never helped Diana when she was in terrible pain. Three of her four children are divorced. Because there was cold mothering on her part. I'm sorry, I don't see a divine pe person here. I respect, totally respect, the fact that she's lived through the, an astonishing history. I will always respect that. And as a nation, I respect the fact that she's an old person. And I always will give her that respect. But please don't tell me she's perfect and divine and yeah. we love her. I don't. It's artful PR. So they've, they've been very, very good at managing her. She's never given an interview to anybody. Really? Never? Never. Apart, weirdly, from a quarter interview, I think you could call it, with Rolf Harris. Mm. Oh. When, when he was painting a portrait oh, of yes. her during mm. the 2012 um, yeah, Jubilee. Yeah. She did engage with him, and I, I think and that James was... And James Bond, didn't she, briefly? That, well, was that, was, that was a stage thing. But she's never actually given an interview. So this is the big difference, because when you have Charles become king, there's an entire, you know... There are the tapes with Camilla back in the 90s, 
talking about tampons and things like that. There's other uh, things beside There's that. other things beside that. But, but the, the mystique of monarchy will never be able to be applied to them. And the, and the, apart from that one bit of wrong footing in 68 with the royal family documentary, they've artfully managed her image to the point where nobody really knows who she is, what she thinks, what she does. So I think you're absolutely right. The trouble is the vast majority of people view the Queen in that how we have been told to view her manner and therefore that's a, an ironclad bit of armour to break through to try and demonstrate that there is not that magical form. No, and that was Walter Badshot, is that how you say it? Or yeah, said Badshot, that yeah. they, the royals survive because of the mystique. Yeah. And the minute you break down that, that thin veil between us and them, then, you know... It, it's a dangerous thing for them. Mm. Um, but what else? I mean, we'll get on to more uh, this with Tom Burke in a moment. But if there were a question on Ballard Times, you know, with the fracturing over Brexit, with the kind of culture wars, with sort of fissiprous, I love that word, Northern <laughs> Ireland potentially moving to a union with the Republic, Scotland going back to independence, don't know what happens in Wales. Um, what else holds Britain, modern UK, together because we have devolved parliaments and an English nationalist government, except the Queen. And without her, what is the glue for this country? Isn't it such a depressing thing to say, even think that? That you need this person or this family, which is incredibly um, imperfect, let me be polite, as the glue to hold us together. Can we not have... There's a wonderful history here. There are amazing Britons who made Britain what Britain is. There's Shakespeare. There is, um, and you know, you would have to include some of the, the architects of the, um, um, uh, the not, uh, let's bypass empire, but the architects of that sense of justice and fairness that permeates this society. But Yasmin, that... Is great, and they a lot of them appear increasingly on banknotes and and stamps. But she's the head of state, and we talk about this. She's supposed to have a power to stop errant prime ministers. That's not just a historical role, is it, Hardy? It's not. She does have you know parole prerogative yeah. powers uh, to act as a check on the prime minister, but she chooses by convention not to exercise them because she's unelected. But we're going to discuss uh, a lot more about the Constitution with our next guest, Tom Burke, who I have a feeling might disagree pretty heavily with Otto and Yasmin. But he'll be joining us in, at our tea party in just a few moments. But first, let's take a look back at some of the Queen's more modern uh, aspects of her reign. Good evening, Mr. Bond. Good evening, Your Majesty. Really? Oh, yeah. I don't think I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very much like it's arrived. Yes, I'm getting on holiday. Here's the doll cup! Estimate has done it! And the Queen is watching her Philly Estimate win the race for which she is meant to present the trophy. Her Majesty the Queen only presents two trophies during Royal Ascot, and look at the delight there, the sheer joy. We'll be handing over to Claire Balding who is going to be the MC for proceedings. Now, what? <laughs> now this I like. Oh, Did you see that? Is he instructing? Fitch. Hey. Heavy? Well, I think it's three pounds or something. Quite heavy. Comfortable, ma'am? No. <laughs> <laughs> now, nothing like that is comfortable. Just put it on, it stays. I mean, it, it just remains yeah. itself. You have to keep your head very still. Yes. And you can't look down to read the speech. You have to take the speech up. Because if you did, your neck would break. It would fall off. So there are some <clears throat> disadvantages to crowns, but, but otherwise they're quite important things. Can I ask if the crown could be brought a little bit closer to the Queen? Oh, there we go. 
<laughs> this is what I do when I wear it. So welcome back to the Tea Party. I'm joined by some scotch and by another scotch drinker, Tom Burke. Welcome. Welcome, Tom. Happy to be here. Lovely to have you. Now, you're brought on here not as a sacrificial victim, but as a profound thinker. <laughs> found think about notions of democracy and environmental death and, and suffering and we talked a while back last year and we talked about the democratic deficit in this country mm -hmm. how especially with Boris Johnson all these uh, institutions are, are being undermined and you said well the, what there's something that can help us out and you said monarchy can you unpack that yeah it, it, it really goes back actually not to anything so much about the UK but it goes back to what happened in the Nixon years and a book that was written by Theodore White I was a complete Watergate fanatic I, I could probably tell you the story from beginning to end but what what Theodore White wrote a book called a breach of faith and his his point was that Nixon had made and why it was so difficult for the Americans to deal with this was that he was in breach of faith because he had defended the man with the office right and what that triggered for me as a political kind of thinker was the importance of separating the office from the man in other words separating what you feel emotionally mm. connected to from what you feel operationally connected to. so political because the, the president is the head of state in the US and the executive. Yes, and that, that had caused, and we see that even more now with Trump, that causes enormous confusion, very difficult for people to take a dispassionate view of the head of state mm -hmm. uh, uh, at the same time as they take a sort of dispassionate, critical view of the head of government. So I like the idea that we have a, a, a separation between the head of state and the head of government, and that you can feel perfectly comfortable with the head of state being as our constitutional monarch is, very restrained in what they can do, and you can be as noisy, loud and aggressive as you like about how bad the government is, especially right now. But I guess there's an issue in that. Because the monarch is unelected, Queen Elizabeth has chosen not to exercise certain royal prerogative powers, which could act as a check, a more explicit check on the prime minister and the executive. But if she was to get involved and start to do that, people might start saying she's meddling in politics. Well, and, and, they'd, so, uh, and they'd be quite right about that. But uh, there's a grey area, is there not? That... Well, there, there's, there, you can't discuss this without actually connecting in history. We used to start off with the divine right of kings is where this mm -hmm. starts. And there's a long process of which we've been backing into for well, probably since Magna Carta, of trying to make Britain a democracy. And that stage where we took mm. away the divine right of kings, and that wasn't as long ago mm. as people think, was, was quite an important part of that. So we're still in the process of, as it were, perfecting our democracy. Uh, we've, just, we've just made several stages, steps on the way. Yasmin has wants to say <laughs> so, Tom, she's going to disagree. I agree with you. No, absolutely agree with you that the head of state should be separate from the operational... Uh, people I and there are other models and they they do actually work in Ireland the president is elected and why that is important in any democracy worth its name is that any child born in Ireland has that possibility okay well, and and that's important because you can't be a democracy as we are and have a privileged family where the, any child born into that family will be, from birth, privileged. That's my problem. Well, I have, I have less of a problem with privilege than, than you do, really. I mean, I don't, I don't see that as an issue. I like the stability created by uh, 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 a constitutional monarchy. I think that helps quite a lot. And you're right about there being other models. There are other models, but as Winston Churchill said about democracy itself, it's the worst form of government bar all the others. I, don't, I can't think of a, of a model that I think is inherently better. In other words, separated from the culture that produces it. No, and by the way, it took quite a lot of a by the English to create a, a, an Irish aspiration I culturally am, for I democracy. I am astonished that you think a democracy in which we are all born equal. Is that, yeah? is there a, a, a solution here? I mean, it's a crazy thing. It comes out of sortition, you know, this whole principle of democracy you randomly <laughs> select to a random process 12 of the people, like jury service. The Dalai Lama, I mean, there is I some... the same problem. 
Well, that is anybody. It's not anybody in Nepal who plays with the objects in the right way. Well, no, there is still this idea that it is not, it is an inherited privilege. Right, right. Well, I have well, the same problem with that. Well, I, you can argue very strongly it's actually an inherited duty, uh, an obligation. It's not just an inherited... There are lots of privileges that go with it, but there are also quite a lot of obligations that go with it. Uh, and so, I, I, you know, you, you can take different views about and which Tom, model what, works best. What do, you, what, what do you see as some of the problems with an elected head of, head of state, a president for the UK? Well, imagine the thought that we elected... Boris Johnson as our head of state. But we already have. State. I mean. No, we haven't. We've elected him as our head of government and we'll be yeah. perfectly comfortable about getting rid of him. But in five years, we could get rid of him. Yeah, that's right. And I like the idea that actually we have a constitutional monarchy which is struck with the, the, the notion that, the, as you say, the privileges come with an awful lot of duties and obligations and that what that provides is we don't have to answer the question who every time because, you know, I'm not sure that uh, 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 answering that question guarantees that you'll get a better answer. And, you know, for every time it's you can... It's so unfair, Tom. Do you well, not see the fundamental unfairness of no, this. No, I don't, because I've never wanted to be the monarch. It's never been an aspiration of mine to be treated you know, to be a monarch. No, I don't, nor is I it don't. mine. I don't want to be queen. Well, this is always my mother's point, by the way, because she was that mix. She was to say you wouldn't want to be a monarch. Mm. That she emphasised, by the way, and I'm not, the duties, the boredom of it, you know, that it was a burden. Now, maybe that's brilliant PR, but that's the way that generation saw it. It was a burden. And now, so we now have the atrocious um, sight of this revered queen who actually I think a lot of people do think they've stopped going to church but they love the monarchy actually mm -hmm. there's something quite weird here mm. uh, you know duty to God and the queen I've always rejected that but with bringing Andrew back into the public how is that okay <laughs> well, I don't so this is at the Thanksgiving service. I, I think I'm, Prince I'm Philip not, recently... I'm not going to try to answer the for the behaviour of, of the Queen or anybody else. So, so, was, what do you think? Okay, let's... I don't, uh, frankly, do I think that Andrew behaved extremely badly and brought the monarchy into disrepute? Yes, I do uh, think that. Do I think that it was right or wrong for the Queen to make that decision? I have no idea why she made it. Let me ask you a slightly wider question, Tom. What do you think are some of the misconceptions, in your view, of the royal family? Maybe prevalent. Well, I'm not sure. I, I mean, <laughs> Yasmin is a very good example of them that somehow it's. But why are they? Of, I, I don't know why people. Uh, I, it's not an issue that I've ever got very wound up about. Mm. Um, uh, uh, just as a, as a person who's really involved in politics and, and involved in okay. politics very broadly, I like the stability provided by not having so, to Yasmin, answer the question. Why, let me ask you why do you think this is an issue that you do get wound up about? Mm. Because. Why? In, why? Uh, because this is a democracy. We have someone in power, the Queen, she has immense power, uh, let's not forget it. Behind the scenes she exercises a huge amount of power, um, who is seen as somebody you do, you know, the politicians, at least politicians, go through the process of being elected, go through that. <laughs> event. She, th this lot absolutely sit on their laurels and whatever bad they do and boy they've done some really awful stuff yeah you know you know has been the idea that we live in a democracy seems to me a bit of a mistaken perception. We live in a government, under a government that was elected by less than 40% of the people in a system that. that doesn't begin to approximate yeah, your properly you. democratic system. And by the way, the people who sustain that system have real power and the best you can say about the monarchy is it has influence. So this is a very interesting point, quite a persuasive point, Tom, is that we don't live in a democracy, and there are other institutions, Rupert Murdoch, which have much more power than a monarchy. But can you not answer uh, this question then? You're saying that they are mitigating to some of the worst aspects as a head of state. Could they do that with less flummery at a lower sure. rate, like a, a like a ceremonial like a ceremony, like the Netherlands or something else? And is it particularly because you know the heir to the throne, you trust him, you like him? 
is you're saying it's not about the person, it's about the institution, because <laughs> that provides continuity. Are you sure if Prince Andrew, for some reason, was actually the heir to the throne, you'd feel the same? I don't know that I would feel the same uh, about the particular monarchy. Uh, that's not my point, really. You're talking about the institution. I'm just talking about how the institution fits into our rather undemocratic state and what it provides in that rather undemocratic state. And you're right, I do know uh, uh, the Prince of Wales. I met him first a long time ago. Um, but in a sense, that's not why I believe in the monarchy. He, I believe in the idea that a, a constitutional monarchy is a, a better form of government than we've otherwise had in this country is because of the stability it provides. And actually because the monarch doesn't have power. Monarch does have influence. But as you've pointed out, actually Rupert Murdoch has more influence and is a lot less accountable. And not only Rupert Murdoch, but also the Barclay brothers and, the, and, and Viscount yeah, Rothermere sure. as well. And if this queen is supposed to represent the best of us, right? The best of Britishness. She's never been to a food bank. Well, I'm sorry. If you no, no, think, I'm if sorry. You think, well, if she I've cares never, about... I've never been to a food bank. Yeah, but you're not the Queen. Well, no. She's supposed to care about all oh, her people. come on. Yeah. What you're, do you mean? You're, well, what, what, do you're you doing, mean? what you're doing is writing a headline. You're not really making a no, serious point. No, I'm making point. a very serious point. No, you're not. What, what's incredible. a serious point? There are people going hungry who are using food banks. Wouldn't it be great if she made a symbolic... Well, well it might be, but what's Can I finish? Well, well, can she come if you're and, make and a stood... Point and visited a food bank and put pressure on the government, which has created the situation where we've got these food banks. Don't you think that would be important? No, 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 no I don't actually think yeah, it'd be important. I think not. you're trivialising points it's not just to a make, trivial just to make no, a no, headline. No, 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 no. Take it to another, which is when the Queen and the Queen Mother visited the East End after the blitz, it took a long time. That was an important moment. Uh -huh. They were sharing the suffering. When Princess Diana yeah, she went was to great. an AIDS war, so is there not, if they have a magical body, the magical thing, you know, they used to give out gifts, that's what Boxing Day is, these magical gifts the monarch would give out. Isn't what Yasmin's saying correct? No, Peter, symbolic... what, you're saying is, what you're saying is I've got a list of things, somewhere on the list of things you could do to demonstrate all those things which I actually think most people in this country do think the Queen expresses. That's mm. somewhat what we take pride but, in. You're just picking up a long list and saying, well, she didn't do that one, so all the rest of it we can ignore. I think that's a really true. point, So let me point, take it frankly. to uh, a much more recent uh, sort of development. So we had the Queen's speech uh, just uh, in the last month. And it was interesting because we had the Queen's speech without the Queen and Prince Charles was opening present Parliament, with speech, the yes. opening of state opening of Parliament, the Queen's speech. And we had Prince William and uh, the Duchess of Cornwall with him. And Prince and, Charles. And, uh, yeah, yeah, Prince Charles. I said that. <laughs> What what did you what did you, Tom? Let me sorry. What did you make of that? Did you well, think that was well, an interesting moment and it looked a bit odd? No, I suspect started? I suspect that if Prince Charles had written the speech, I'd have found rather more to agree with it and would have been much more concerned with what was in the national interest and a far less concerned with about keeping the prime minister in his current job. Do you think he'd we, do you think he'd intervene in the? No, I don't think he'd intervene in that. But I'm just saying. Yeah, I was asked what did I think about that. I can tell you exactly what I thought. I thought. David Cancini had written a speech that was entirely about preserving the Prime Minister from his own MPs. And I thought that was a disgrace. And I thought that was terrible. But it's nothing to do with the Queen or the Prince of Wales or anybody else. Yes, I mean, what did you think? Yeah, he's right about that. There, though, but did you two think big cars, <laughs> one, one carrying... One crown. When we're in the middle of this, you know, cost-of-living crisis... I cannot believe we are spending, for example, £12 million has just been spent. Every school child has been given a propaganda book on the greatness of the, of the monarch, OK? We have children who have nothing to eat in this country today. Tom, you care a lot about the environment. Can you not see that I care a lot about poverty? No, I guess no, Yasmin's no, saying it cascades. I, I guess I, I, Yasmin's saying it cascades. Yeah, if you have but, entitlement uh, and hierarchy at the top, it sets the tone for the well, society we live in. they could say, they could say, this is not acceptable. I, I we think, shouldn't I have think, children not eating. I, I think Yasmin is, is committing a classic journalist sin, which is making the uh, perfect 
the enemy of the actually livable with. And I'm perfectly happy to live with the monarchy mm. for all its faults. And by mm -hmm. heaven, it's got plenty of faults. I'm perfectly happy to live with it. I'm looking for some perfection that I can write no, into a column. No, I'm somewhere. not looking for perfection. I'm looking for a real commitment to social justice in this kingdom. So, so this is a really interesting point. Social. Well, I would, I, no, I think I think I, I, Yasmin's right about mm. a real commitment to social. But I'm not looking for the monarch to provide that. I'm looking but for the Boris government. Johnson isn't the going government to. Government is failing in it. So that's the interesting question. Would it make a difference? I've been an on and off Republican, whether it's important or not, thinking it wasn't important. Then now, because of various things that happened, the kind of return of the Etonian class, Eton sits in the shadow of Windsor Castle. That they think they're, you know, they think they're radicals compared that with the monarchy. I see Murdoch on the monarchy. That I again think it's it's important. But is you know any if would a sudden change? Do you want revolution? Do you want coup la tête, uh, a guillotine, or? Or do you think that is... That's not going to happen. <laughs> I think there's a slow uh, But in transition. my time, I might have been one of those revolutionaries. But, I, you know, what I'm not... What would you like now. to see happen, realistically? Like... I want to... Comp well, you know, it's not going to happen. But with Charles, I reckon that that kind of inherited love, if you like, for, for the Queen... And people have forgotten how horribly they all treated Diana. They've forgotten. I remember the Republican moment. I went to Kensington Garden when Diana died. And, I, you know, even as a Republican, I felt so sorry for this child who was plucked up, a damaged child, yeah, uh, which whom Charles should never have used and married. But anyway, um, and the messages were really Republican. And the, that applause, do you remember? Yeah. When the, uh, but to the they, they, saw, they saw, saw it off. But I can imagine a time comes when we demand more of the monarch, whoever it is, and we cut down, cut out the wastrels of whom there are too many. But in the end, for me, it is the principle anyway. I think inherited privilege is, and we understand that when we talk, we got rid of the uh, lords who inherited their seats. We understood it then. Yeah, remember, everybody was very happy to get rid of the laws who were in uh, lords who were sitting there because their dads and granddads were, but we not applying it to the royals, which is illogical. Could you see, Tom, you know him, uh, you respect him and his, some of his opinions obviously fit with your sort of beliefs about the environment, things like that, a monarch who could begin to disengage and slim down to stop this flummery, who could embody well, I, some more of the values, go to food banks, which well, she asked me to say I about. think... Yasmin's right, and there are different models, and there are different models for a constitutional monarchy, and we live next door to several of them, Sweden, yep. Denmark, there are places. So I, could I imagine that? Yes. Will it happen? I don't know any more than Yasmin knows whether she'll get her way. It's not the point. I don't really know what will happen. But you care, well, so you have to know. Well, you have to know what you want. No, well, I, what I want to continue is the stability provided by a constitutional monarchy, which means I can separate my feelings about the government of the country from my feelings about Britain. I, I feel, that hasn't happened. I feel, People have, well, over the last, it's been very unstable since 2006. Well, well, I, feel, I feel actually quite crowd, proud of being British. I feel quite, I like mm. the values, and quite a lot of those values are embodied and expressed in, by the Queen. I feel quite proud of that. I think, I think one of the things I'm most cross about is the way that this government has actually diminished those values and diminished the role of those values in the world. Now, Tell me one thing. Mean, what are the values? Mean, what are the well, values, does, the Britishness values well, the Queen think, represents? I'm I trying think, to learn. I, I am trying to learn yeah, from you. I really am. Yeah, it's a genuine yeah, question. Sure. Well, uh, uh, dignity, uh, patience, uh, um, uh, discretion. There are quite a lot of values uh, that I think are, are important. Uh, I think she's maintained... Her silence in public, I think that's been about. I suspect, by the way, we'll see exactly the same from Prince Charles for all that he's had views that people know about. I don't think if he inherits the crown, when he inherits the crown, I guess I hope, um, that you'll see any difference in that respect. Whether the British people take to that or not, I don't know. Uh, they may he won't not. rewrite the Queen's speech or the King's speech. He won't sort of amend it a bit to be a bit uh, no, more he won't. And that was a bit of an obsession in The Guardian about, about that. And I, when I was a special advisor, I used to, from time to time, see those scrawly spider Oh, the spiders. Bits. Yeah, the, the, I used to see them come across as they went into ministers and stuff, and I know exactly how much 
effect they had on ministers. Which is zero. I, no, I didn't say that, but I know exactly how much effect they had, and it was a lot less than The Guardian seemed to think um, was the effect of those. So, you know, the constitutional role of, of the monarch in our home, Badshot said it, advise, warn and encourage. I'm in favour of that. I think those, by the way, are quite good values of leadership of any kind. I think that's true of corporate leadership as much as it, and military leadership as anything else. You don't inherit corporate leadership. Or no, you don't. Leadership. No, but I'm saying that. Riazman asked me about the values. Right. I think right. that that value and that aspiration to advise, warn, and encourage is a very good example. I, I, of leadership. You should really write a letter to Andrew about these values. Well, no, I agree because with nobody that. and she I is his mother's favourite son. She didn't teach you those values. I, I have to say, I have to say, I'm not about to get into trying to separate okay. mothers from their feelings <laughs> for their children. I think that's... Well, thank you so much. It has been a very interesting tea party for us, hasn't it, Peter? It has, incredible. Uh, I, my, my opinions are swinging one way or another. I agree with Yasmin's passionate republicanism, mm. but I also see Tom's point about continuity. But you know, somewhere between... Maybe... King and Queen. <laughs> I don't want Mary. to be Queen. You might want to be no, King. I, I, was, I was explicit about never wanting to be. Why don't you get nominated for a day? Do you know, I had the Queen on one of my book covers, which is called uh, <laughs> Who Do We Think We Are? And we kind of changed her to look a little bit more Aboriginal. <laughs> and then, uh, for my sins, I was given an award. Uh, an honour, which I then returned. This is the OBE or yeah, the CBE? The C no, the, no, no, nothing as high as that. The MBE. The MBE. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was actually asked, is this a book on republicanism? And I said, no, it actually isn't, but I will write that book one day. <laughs> Wow. I have to wait and wait for that book, maybe not too long. Uh, thank you to Tom Burke and to Yasmin Alibi Brown and to Otto English for joining our Jubilee Tea Party. It has been genuinely uh, fascinating and we hope that it has, uh, yeah, provoked some thoughts for all of you at home. It has been 70 years, as Peter said, an unprecedented reign for any British monarch in history. But what will come afterwards will certainly be a start of a new era. We'll be back next Friday with Friday Night with Byline Times. We'll be back with our blue sofa at 8pm. Uh, so, yes, thank you very much for joining us and wish you uh, a happy rest of the Jubilee weekend. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers.